so I went to uh, uh so hey Eris, thank you for being here. Nice to see hey. you. I haven't had you around in a while, uh friend. How are you? I am good. I I am did I get in at the end of the conversation? No, uh there's well one I would love to hear uh your opinions on this one or the other. And two, uh, I was gonna ask, but we can maybe do this later if you wanna talk about something else. Um about Thinking about the best ways to, to talk about Israel without you know, getting making it anti-Semitic, because you can easily fall into those uh, the, an area fall into tropes, right? Uh, that would be that would be just quite dangerous. Um, what happened was, um, and uh, you weren't here for this. Uh, someone here previously uh, uh, brought up BDS and said that BDS is. Um, if you're a supporter of BDS, you're basically into Smet. The Venn diagram is a circle. Venn yeah. diagram is a circle uh, for that. And I push back <laughs> vehemently on, on that one. Um, and that letter's here. So one, uh, your thoughts on uh, the BDS uh, and movement in general. And two, like, uh, if you could give us your thoughts on like the best way to discuss these things without like actually be becoming problematic, actually uh, spreading um, anti-Semitic uh, tropes. Okay. I mean, I could talk about if you, I could talk about what you just suggested. Um, I can also get into the specific issue that's going on right now with Palestinians getting into their home sure. and the history associated with that. But yeah, that maybe I could do that afterwards. The my overall feelings on BDS is um, if you would have asked me, say like ten years ago, um, if I supported a BDS, I would have said yes, one hundred percent. But just being on a university campus and seeing the effects of um, BDS as, as an organization and the way it's being used and done, it really does feel like it, it's really over time started to feel like a dog whistle, um, especially to a lot of Jewish people. Um, the And I don't, I wouldn't go so far to say, so I wouldn't, so boycotting Israel, I think it's totally fine, non-anti-Semitic, I think that's totally chill. Um, especially if you are a Palestinian or you really connect to the Palestinian cause or whatever. Um, I, the the problem I, I think Red Charlotte also she touched on this that like the problem specifically seems to be the BDS organization um, specifically and the things that they've engaged with um, and the culture that they seem to promote especially that um, they seem to very much focus on delegitimizing Israel as a whole as a state um, which kind of participates in like a very typical um, anti-Jewish anti-Semitic narrative of just completely um, uh, scapegoating Jews, right? Um, and not treating them fairly in comparison with other countries. So I think it's totally fine to say like, okay, I care really about what's going on with the Palestinians right now. I care. I think that there were a ton of problems with the foundation of Israel and all that stuff and to focus on the issue. Um, but the problem is when you look at the foundation of Israel, it's not, it's incredibly bloody. It's founded on ethnic cleansing. It's founded on all these all awful things, but it's not so different than almost any other nation I could think of. Um, in including the nation that you both in the nations you and I like all, all of us are on right now um so that's why Jews are particularly sensitive to this kind of um idea so that's why you have to be really responsible when you talk about this kind of um this kind of thing so the way I always encourage people to to do it is to say like focus on criticizing the Israeli government focus on criticizing Israel's specific actions um, and also stop saying things like Zionism or Israel is a legitimate illegitimate state like don't focus so much on its foundation right because Israel is illegit as illegitimate as almost every nation on earth um, I, I think that like I, I don't I don't agree with the Zionism part because like I I think that ethno-nationalism and nationalism should be like protested and should be pushed back against because like m most most zionism isn't labor zionism or like uh like uh, the like what it originally was was much more secular much more like um it, it's not about having like a yeah, jewish, no, I totally jewish state you. run by jews only for jews no Arabs i don't allowed, have a problem whatever. with people criticizing the theory that like of what zionism technically is I think that's totally fine. The problem is the word Zionism has become a dog whistle for anti-Semites. So it's kind of being ruined. Um, oh, sure. I'm I mean, trying I to think. Yeah, yeah. So like, um, so that's why I would say if you want to criticize, you know, like, so if you're thinking pragmatically of what's useful, right, and you're trying to change people's minds and stuff, it's much more useful to kind of skip through the anti-Semitism part um, and just focus on the actual criticisms um, and the actual issues that you have with the Israeli government. And that's much more useful. Like talking about wiping Israel off the map, 
talking about um, Israel being founded as an illegitimate state, as if any other nation, as if the nations next door are somehow more legitimate, which is just not true. Um, Like tons of these countries, I actually, I really cannot think of one country um, in that exists right now in my head that was not Sweden, baby. Such a problematic. I. I'm not a Swedish historian, so I, I can't push back against that. But like the, um, it, it's one of the problems with nationalism. It's why I really like Noam Chomsky's view on this, um, because he's one of the only, one of the few people I see that criticizes Israel a lot. That's like really fucking consistent. He's just against all forms of nationalism. Um, but and uh, yeah. Eris, so mm, I, 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 first of all, I hear you when um uh talking about the founding of israel and how it's not so different from other countries that's actually a really good point something i had never considered thank you for that i i never actually thought of it that way um but that makes sense you know like everyone else does the same fucking thing honestly um yeah and i don't want to deal it and i don't want to act like it's a small thing either right mm -hmm. um just to to the palestinians themselves they don't really care that it happened to everyone else. Like that's still their lived reality and their history and their um, inherited generational trauma. Well, I still believe in things like reparations and all that stuff that hopefully one day Palestinians will get. Um, but, uh, but like, it's just, it's still important um, to at least keep it in the right context, considering, um, especially considering one of the number one tropes um, for Jews is to treat Jews as being um as being scapegoats right or mm -hmm. like giving um not treating them equally compared to other groups so that's why it's always aware to be aware of that trope so the i think is a big I problem just, i just want to finish my point um the yeah understanding that un, with the context you've given that at this moment though though true so many states have had similar uh starts right um many states aren't <laughs> doing what Israel is doing right now, which is ethnic cleansing. Like that's an ethnic cleansing campaign against uh, our Palestinian brothers and sisters, uh, uh, throwing them out of their homes, right? Um, taking away their uh, rights and and all, all the other stuff. There's that whole list of things that are being done, the indign indign indignities being done to uh, Palestinians. So uh, under the, uh, those circumstances, I think th that um, is, and what's, that was always the focus of my criticism and the people I at least I associate with, um, I can't speak for like this, the larger BDSM uh, organization, um, but the people I've always associated with, that's been our focus is uh, ending uh, the injustices uh, faced by them. Um, so yeah, yeah, I don't know if I would call right now what's going on an ethnic cleansing, um, but I do think the words that I would use, I guess, is I do think that Israel has been breaking international law ever since 1967 um, uh, by, you know, doing the legal occupation and it further and it's breaking further peace treaties whenever it builds more and more settlers. Um, the what I find really, really interesting about the current situation um, that everyone's kind of gotten so upset about is the Palestine, uh, the homes right now, the, the reason why it was won in Israeli courts, because this was done through the Israeli court system, um, which is, you know, I, I mean, it's got its problems, but it's like just as fair as an American court system, right? Um, but the reason why it was won through in the Israeli court system was because the land originally, um, those those areas were originally owned by Jews and Jews and Jewish settlers, not sorry, not Jewish settlers, but Jewish people had lived on that area of land until um, until 1948. Be when Jor um, when Jordan actually ended up taking that land um, uh, from the original mandate of Palestine and ended up kicking and naturally all the Jews had to be ethnically cleansed of the area initially and move into Israel. So this has been uh, basically it's been a land reallocation um, and as a way to kind of so-called right right the wrongs of the past it's very very similar to kind of what's going on in south africa right now with kind of like land reallocations and all that stuff um and or like i guess like a land back like attitude just you know from a um a jewish nationalist perspective um and i think it, if anything it really demonstrates one of the problems and i hope lefties kind of um see now one of the the huge issues you have like when you try to so-called right or wrong of the past um because it was obviously wrong that the jewish people got um who lived in that area got kicked out when jordan took over um a lot of people don't talk about um the ethnic cleansing of arab nations um right when 1948 happened um of jews so um so that was really bad but like 
you know, does it mean that current Palestinians have to suffer for, you know, the crimes of what happened beforehand? Not necessarily. And so um, it's one of the problems with a lot of lefty arguments about like, you know, kind of the reallocation of land um, in general. Definitely. And I think I think the major protest that is coming from this is that I don't think people necessarily have an issue with the 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 redistributive justice that is is happening on the side of the Israeli courts. I think the issue then comes from the supposed hypocrisy of that justice, because I don't think anyone would disagree that someone writing wrongs from history is is a is a good idea we should try to write those wrongs but when the the those those wrongs are only being righted on one particular side that then becomes an issue so for example the the forced um removal of of certain arab populations in in the old city and in jerusalem in particular um, like an old lady has... going out for groceries and then coming back later that day to find uh settlers like taking her house and her house being confiscated by the government yeah yeah and also the the lack of clamping down on um industries that buy up uh arab land and sell it on to um israeli property owners those are issues that the israeli state really should clamp down on like the illegal settlements that they that they don't clamp down on as much as they ought to and i think that's where the the indignation is coming from 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 certain from certain perspectives yeah i mean it's hard for them to crack down on it when they're the ones doing it right um well no that's that's not that's specifically not true the so so there are two different kinds are you saying bb doesn't be no i'm I'm saying talked about i'm saying that there 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 are two different types of illegal settlements, quote unquote. And I think Eris can back me up on this. So there are s- almost state sponsored um, occupations and settlements that are um, strategically planned. And then there are the so-called illegal uh, settlements mm-hmm. that are that are done by extremist activists within Israel itself. And they're typically um, yeah. ultra orthodox activists that um, will go out very far into the West Bank uh, and settle there against the Israeli state's wishes, um, and and just do that themselves without any state interference. The state doesn't want them necessarily to do that, mostly because it provides a security issue for those citizens, and it also goes against state strategic planning. It's just like yeah, it's it's not convenient for Israel when it's not organized, it, all that stuff for demographic purposes. The and one of the reasons that this causes another issue, right? And this is why Israelis should never be painted with one brush because they're just as Israelis are just as complex and diverse in terms of opinions and, you know, attitudes and religious um attitudes as Americans. The um it, one of the problems is uh, the reason why these like extremist um, Jewish religious groups will go and um, live in these areas is because they know if the Israeli government tries to remove them, as they did when they when Ariel Sharon pulled out of Gaza, those videos go viral within Israeli communities um, and are particularly religious communities, and they start spreading it as you know the secular Jews are trying to ethnically cleanse us the Orthodox Jews out of like our, you know, our natural right. So they start spreading that kind of propaganda um, of just being kicked out of their homes. And they say, we're only, we're being kicked out literally just because we're Jewish. And that's like, um, and that's used against other fellow Jews too. So that's like why it's just a really bad, bad combination. Even the state state ran settlements are still classified as war crimes by international like communities. Not, not just the, like the, the crazy people out there, like civilians, like just, like the yeah, government, but, the government doing stuff itself by removing someone and then putting someone in is, since it's a conflict, it is considered a war crime. So anti, it is important. Uh, anti, this is amazing that you would say that, um, Aris, talking about like Jews using anti, and I've heard this in America, right? Like Jews using the charge of anti-Semitism against other Jews. Um, which is fan- they've used it against Bernie. <laughs> they used it against Bernie. Right? Like it, it just happens at any minority, right? There's always gatekeeping. There's and there's always nuances. Sometimes people do have points. I've definitely, um, I was recently a victim of anti-Semitism by another Jewish person. Like people can really absorb um, racist narratives. I mean, we see that with tons of like I don't know, like Candace Owens and stuff with this shit. I've seen her say against black people. So like that stuff does happen. 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's always correct. And yeah, obviously, especially with the Orthodox Jews in Israel, I find that it's often not correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's very, very frustrating to watch, um, especially with the amount of power, the, um, like uh, the Haredi, which is the, the term that's used um, for Orthodox Jews in Israel, uh, the amount of power that they have um, uh, in the Israeli government because of the system of coalitions with Netanyahu is very, very concerning. And it sucks, like not just for Palestinians, it sucks for uh, anyone who is a part of any kind of minority that they don't approve of, like women or gay people or trans people and um, a lot of stuff like that. So I wanted I mean, to I... uh, talk to you about, uh, well, one, again, I think this, this anti-Semitic thing is, it's a great way to just ending a debate. It's like, well, it's anti-Semitic, so that's, that's it. We can't dig any deeper uh, than that. Like, just uh, uh, puts a stop to that. But two, uh, what you said previously about... Um, diversity of thought and certainly absolutely the case <laughs> for any group it's going to be a diversity of thought if you're, if you're looking at all in one rush then you, uh, then you're being prejudiced i mean it's like definition of being prejudiced um hmm. but in terms of uh their political landscape um and it's something i guess i really want to learn more about because it seems like the conservatives are firmly in power and have been so for decades uh from my understanding um like what, ever, ever where, since... what is the uh like the political left there right like it seems like if there is uh any sort of significant um uh left movement that that wants to end these things right like why why aren't we seeing um them winning um uh, seats in parliament like uh, controlling seats in parliament um it's always the uh oh it has a so, it has yeah. to do with I, the I, israeli coalition system okay um, yeah I, can the, I i would like to talk about that part sure yeah um i mean much recently the the good coalition that uh, Netanyahu has built up has not has been much waning compared to the days when he eventually was first got into power around the early 2000s and a lot of that has been done through many like uh quick elections that have been going on i think like last year we had like three elections try trying us to form a coalition government and it failed many times and much recently i think Netanyahu even was under indictment by their fellow supreme court uh, for corruption charges it's a lot of it a lot of it now in the uh, israel is very much at least now open to change and it, it is starting, and it's probably seeing happening with more of a coalition of the left so, getting more power. So, okay, um, there have been four elections, four elections, and they haven't resulted in uh, yeah. a, a coalition being built yet. Um, yeah. uh, but though apparently uh, there was some news, I didn't get to dig into it, that uh, there might be some coalition that's forming right this moment. Um, might be a possibility yeah. for that. But like, it seemed like, and again, I've. I can't say I'm an expert here, so if I if you guys know that I'm saying something wrong, please correct me because I don't know. Um, but it, it seems like there's Netanyahu's uh, party, but then like the second um, biggest uh, coalition or, or, or uh, party choice was another conservative party, basically, um, uh, and their their head was basically saying was mirroring what what uh, Bibi Netanyahu was talking about in terms of. Um, his conservative attitudes towards Palestinians, right? This yeah. cracking down on them. So, so this, again, it this doesn't seem like the, the left is like almost non-existent, well, at least politically. There, but, you're but, completely correct. They're you're not. Completely it's correct. not that they're. It's not that they're not well, consistent, right? Oh um, no, no, non-existent, yeah, non-existent. Well, a lot of it's difference between their economic policies is different. I think one so, of them is more austerity, and the other one is a lot more liberal in their economic policies. Mm. The, the issue that Israel has in terms of its politics is that you're, you're right, the, the left or even the center left has, has been dead in Israel for a long, long time. Um, and this is mainly due to one particular historical event. And I, I think I'm right in saying it was it was the Yom, Yom Kippur War. Um, in the which, 1970s, yeah. Yeah, in the 1970s. So um, from the existence um, of, of Israel, um, the labor the labor party was was in charge they they um they ruled for a long long yeah, time huge reforms um, yeah. all until uh the Yom Kippur war which was the moment of i, I can't remember what what israelis call it something along the lines was the devastation or, or something yeah, like that it, it was where, a war 
do you want me to, do you want me to explain it the, what the war is about well, I mean, it was essentially just a surprise attack from from all yeah. sides by all of israel's enemies and their intelligence agencies completely failed them in in trying to respond to the attack so they right. israel was completely the, put the, off the foot. point the point is that conflict breeds the forces of reaction people become more right-wing people become more like well, no, it, uh, was, it wasn't whatever. necessarily like, that like, like, this labor labor zionism has been dead for decades it's like the right well, wing has cemented itself in israel like 60 67 percent of like young people in israel well, identify as right wing like well, no, it, young it, people it wasn't, there's it a wasn't, very clear reason for that and i and like honestly i wouldn't even say it was the yom kippur war because i think there were some good labor movements that happened um in the 90s um one of the biggest uh peace allocation was offered at camp david i think what in 1999 or 2001 i forget which one um, uh, to Yasser Arafat and I can tell you that it is hard for me to believe Israel ever offering that peace deal again and with that peace deal especially um, there were two major events that happened uh, sorry three major events that happened that cemented why Israelis are um, less likely to kind of um, be going for peace and more labor movements number one was Yasser Arafat rejecting that peace deal in which um, uh, almost almost every single um, a Palestinian request was offered except for the right to return. Um, they even offered reparations, um, substantial re reparations for the land loss. Um, it was rejected even though the majority of Palestinians wanted to accept it um, because Yasser Arafat was corrupt and had already planned out a bunch of things and there's like that's a very complex issue. Um, then number two was the pullout in got um number two was the second intifada um which happened right afterwards in the early 2000s almost every israeli person i know lost someone in the second intifada um and uh which was you know a series of regular um uh terrorist attacks that were made to ma make israelis um terrified to leave their homes to do anything in public um and i can tell you i was in israel uh, during that time briefly and it was a very very scary time um and i and it's a very that that particular is very interesting because even historians um, like Benny Morris, really famous historian that was the person that, you know, invented. Well, he discovered the 700,000 RPG um, uh, number and he put all this work into trying to research uh, the of what happened to the Palestinians in 1948 was incredibly sympathetic to Palestinians. This, he lost someone in the second intifada and now he's super right wing. He went from being extremely left wing pro Palestinian to being now he's like extremely right wing in Israel, and that I think that's just a demonstration of how exactly what um, Red Charlotte was saying, right? You lose someone, and especially after getting a peace deal like rejected, even though it wasn't the Palestinians that really rejected it, was their it was the leadership. Um, which wasn't really democratic at the time anyways. And then a third, the final thing is when um, Ariel Sharon pulls out of Gaza um, as a big kind of peace offering um, to Palestinians. And immediately Hamas starts using the land to start launching rockets, right? So you have to understand that when there's politics going on from labor, uh, from like the left and right in Israel, um, the right can always say, well, when we listen to you, you know, yeah, and, you, and we pulled shit. out of Gaza, then now look at like now Gaza is just a launching ground to terrorize ter terrorize us more. So it's just like they and this is one of the problems I always like is that um, when Palestinian leadership and this is why I would always say like never support the type of Palestinian leadership that just feeds into right wing and Netanyahu like hands um, because Netanyahu wants more rockets, right? Actually, I shouldn't assume that, right? But it's like it's very yeah, it's, useful it's for true. him politically. Right. I, I just what? I don't want to get fucking sued here, um, but uh, <laughs> but it's more um, but it's very useful for him politically. Every single time Palestinian does anything that uh, any gun, sh um, any shooting, any stabbing, anything like that just creates more right wingers and gives more ammo to that. And that's just the unfortunate truth. Yeah. And like even when like labor has a government, it's like they've had governments in recent history. But when I have governments, it's coalition governments and they only make up like 13, 20 seats. Right. Even they, they don't have the ability to like dish out legislation that's just labor legislation, right? The the parties they have to co like do a coalition with hold enough like mm -hmm. positions that the right holds to be enough to stop any sort of progress. Like it, there's no like actual left in Israel anymore. The left is dead, like actual left. And it's been long dead for a long time. I wouldn't say it's like it's dead. It's just not politically powerful. Like, are there um, polls on like what percent right of well, like Israelis believe in yeah, believe there, amongst? There's a party. There's a left party there, but they they don't really have the much Labour seat. Party and the Communist Party. They no. only have like a collective of like 15 seats in Parliament. 
So, yeah, yeah, I mean, isn't you're, you're saying they're not just not powerful, um, Aris, but isn't that literally the same thing? Like, no, I mean, because I think implying that it's dead, a like I get concerned about it because it kind of implies that, um, that there aren't uh, a huge number of Israelis that aren't like supportive of more peaceful resolutions, and um, then why aren't they voting and they're, for and that, they're, though, right? Like, if they're... They are, but you have to understand that that's not the only issue in Israel, right? Um, uh, there are, keep in mind, there are a multitude of issues in Israel, and those parties are just not very powerful for a multitude of other reasons as well. Um, is, is there, like, a so, poll I can find yes, um, that we're, like... I'm pretty sure the majority of my... Israelis are against the illegal occupation. No, 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 no. Um, I, I don't know if that's... Tr I, I can look that up in a second, but I was wondering, like, what amongst... Like, if there's a poll amongst people who identify as Zionists, like, what percent of people are labor Zionists, right? Because that's, like, the type, the type of, like, identify... Like, identity as a person who identifies as Zionist picks is very indicative of whether they're, like, left or right wing. I'm very much down to the Sure, but keep in mind, someone might like there. I, for example, there's an organization in, uh, um, in, uh, in both Israel and the United States called New Israel Fund. Um, it's a very, very left wing organization in terms of its Palestinian, um, politics and you know and being being very pro peace. Um, and all of that stuff. And it's not economically left wing at all. It's just like there's different dynamics of what we would consider like left. That's why I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd even call it labor right now. Um, um, it says, I found a poll. It says half of Israelis support West Bank annexation. I would okay, yeah. So then I, that, that I, says to me that 50% of Israelis are not um, uh, are not in support of the, the occupation. That seems incredibly high to me, just just off the basis of you saying that. Um, well, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't find it surprising in a country where 53% of people want to expel Arabs, right? It's not people hold like people who hold that kind of view probably hold other shitty views too right I, I, yeah, well there's I, also I, demographic issues that have been different as well um the for example the religious and i think this is the same in a lot of other countries as well uh, where religious people tend to have more babies and um and so like the orthodox jews are just increasing in numbers and more left-wing secular jews are you know having Not maybe having one kids. kid or no kids um and so now especially with zoomers coming of age and stuff the the effect is real i mean if you just look um if you just look at the numbers of the uh of what happened what was it like last week or two weeks with the stampede um the the stampede everyone knew that um that that was going to be a complete disaster um and the police like had very very little control over that city uh because of the amount of control that the orthodox rabbis had um even with the vaccines the reason why the vaccine rollout was so successful in israel is israel had to make all these like um the government had to make all these allocations and deals with the rabbis in order to convince people because they they always have to work with the rabbis to get anything done um in a lot of in a lot of cities and Whoa. it's really really unfortunate but then there are cities like tel aviv that are not like that at all well look ladies yeah. look ladies i'm willing to do my part for a bright leftist future are you willing to do your part so i have to ask yeah no you all you guys all have to have babies like <laughs> this is like it's always i'm telling you like this this leftist movement that i've seen where everyone is like anti-natalist yep. it's like really you know we need to start you know getting that out of that because what? it's it's really it's really really fucked up well, it's, um, the, it's, it's often right. the people it's often the people who like are concerned about the effects of having kids that are usually the ones that are probably going to have could be good parents because they're going to be self-critical too yeah. so you should but, have like, babies. but like pro-natalist um views are usually right wing like the the right wing of like the france right wing always been like we need to have more babies we, we, we have killed so many people in our war which we need more babies yeah that's I what i mean we should steal everywhere. that argument no, the best way to make people have more kids is to simply pay them to have more kids. You're not going to like convince people to start that, having kids. I agree with that, Red Charlotte. Having kids I agree with that. It's not an effective people, policy. And, and, and this is, this is like my only like close to... It just hasn't worked. It, like, it, Germany's a perfect it, example. It, it literally has. It worked with Finland. It, 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 absolute, like, their it, abs it absolutely hasn't. Like Germany has tried this since... I, I since can post, the, time I can post of, the study. Since, since the time of Bismarck, Germany has attempted to grow their population through federal programs, and it just hasn't worked. Like, uh, I, I think Germany still has the policy to this day, and it's, it's only had a minimal impact. Yeah, but there were trying... a few hiccups. Like, okay, but can you, can yeah, you like, describe like, those policies specifically? Because I bet they aren't just, like, if you have a kid, you get X amount of money. Well, it, yeah, like, it a lot of fascists. Yes, it was. 
<laughs> like the, the 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 current the, I'm pretty sure the current German government still adopts the Nazi era policy of um straight up tax deductible um income and I think they just give you money for a certain amount of kids that you have. The only difference is that um in Nazi Germany they actually gave you medals for having certain amounts of kids. Yeah, it, it was, and it Italy. Was, it was glorified to such an extent that a woman that had over, I think it was, I want to say it was eight children. That's was, in was, Italy. Was seen as one, no, it was in Germany as well. They, they were seen as these almost war hero type figures. Um, but that's, that's just getting beside the point. Um, I, I just want to talk about the men who sacrifice so much to make those babies too. I just feel like <laughs> this is you, 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 you can just look I at know, polls, like why do people not want kids? And like the biggest reasons amongst almost all polls are, I'm just not economically prepared for it. I just don't have money. Like, I can't well, what's interesting it. is the Haredi in Israel, the religious in Israel, are actually even poorer than seculars, and they're still having, uh, still having children, right? So there's obviously another aspect that's going on, um, like ideologically, yeah. that connects to that. But um, just, I guess, like kind of to sum up, like I don't, um, I don't support the like the BDS movement as in like the organization i don't think it's effective um i think it's connections to a lot of anti-semitic rhetoric and um anti-semitic events and stuff like i can tell you that most jews like that i've met on university campus like everyone is scared um during a israeli apartheid week no one's even people who believe that what's going on in israel is an apartheid state like it's just no one's looking forward to it because we just know that like all the jewish organizations like all the um anyone who's wearing a jewish star or anything is just going to be berated with palestine um uh, screaming and all that stuff and it's like I, I know that I once was bringing a historian from an Israeli university um, who does a lot of research on um, on the effects of Palestine uh, on the uh, detriments of the 1940 war and the Palestinians um, and really believes in Palestinian rights and everything and he was barred from the university um, because of the BDS or organization because they said that um, we were supporting an Israeli institution because he came from uh, institution um and i do consider that the kind of thing i do consider that anti-semitic because i just do not see that level of um I, that level of just completely banning academics from you know speaking at universities um n not because of their views but because of the institutions or uh, that and the, the countries that they're from mm. um i think that that's particularly problematic I, if you want to ban them from their views whatever right like that's a different a discussion um but yeah the way bds has and and but you know it's certainly possible that bds can be reformed right um i mean fatah has somewhat reformed from what it used to be when it was the plo so it's certainly like possible um but i do think it's understandable why a lot of jews and a lot of people would consider like the organization anti-semitic yeah i just want to like concur with what you just said like um i i mean i, I did my bachelor's in london and it was right next to um my university was right next to uh soas if you know what that is um and it's a it's a rather popular base for anti-israeli movements and every every year like the especially in the london universities there were so many cases of anti-semitism and uh, the jewish students i i know because I, I was talking to a few of them that they were scared to come on campus during during that period because they knew that they were going to be harassed not because they were israeli because hardly any of them were israeli it's because they were jewish they just happened to be jewish yeah how you know if someone's anti-semitic um, is if they ask an israeli person unannounced and like completely like out of nowhere uh, how what they feel about like palestine or israel or whatever <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, makes... I could tell you that I had an event happen to me when I was in my undergrad. Um, back then, I was very, very dogmatic against Israel, like on, like full like anti-Zionist level. Um, probably responding to, I was like reacting to my early Zionist upbringing. Um, so I'd gone the exact opposite way, and I went and joined like every Palestinian rights organization I could. Um, and I joined the main one on my campus, and they found out that I was an Israeli citizen. You know, through no fault of my own, I was just—I just happened to be born there. Um, I even rejected going to the army for like moral reasons and all that stuff. Um, but they, when they found out I was an Israeli citizen and I didn't believe in wiping Israel off the map, they took me off of the list. Um, and they never asked any any of the other people who are not Jewish that question or the other non-Israelis that question. Um, and all they cared about for everyone else was whether or not you were Palestinian rights, but it seemed like Jews had to kind of prove that they were one of the good ones. Um, and that yeah. really, really sucked. 
So, and I mean, every minority knows what I'm talking about, like with that kind of attitude. So like, mm -hmm. it is an issue, right? Um, but it doesn't mean you don't have to, like you can't criticize Israel anymore. You just need to be a little more careful um, with your language and how you do it and just do it more and responsibly. I think it's an issue that especially university campuses suffer from, but also these online spaces as well in that people will proclaim such strong opinions and str such strong interests towards certain things when in reality they aren't particularly educated on the topic. So, I mean, I, I know from my personal experience in university campuses, people, people will always, they are either completely for a Palestinian state and, and to the extent of being anti-Semitic, wiping Israel off the map, or they deny Palestine's existence completely. And it's, it's the case of, well, if you were to ask them who Arafat was, they would find it very difficult to actually answer that question. Or even when was the Israeli state created? Just basic things that, you know, show knowledge of the subject. They just don't know. And that's where the issues come from because people aren't knowledgeable and they think that they are and they shout when they should be listening. Oh, and just the Palestinians themselves, right? Um, it's unfair. Israelis um, tend to paint them with just one brush. And they are there are so many complex layers within Palestinian society um, on top of like, you know, being an oppressed peoples and what that does often to communities and how and the divides it creates like the elections going on right now um, within Palestine are nuts like um, and it's it's so in depth that like I like I'm certainly not educated enough on it. Um, it's like yeah it there's there's a lot to it there's money involved there's corruption involved um a lot of people a lot of israelis think oh well if you don't want to kill us then why are you always supporting hamas but the problem is is that uh hamas is not is not as corrupt um and hamas still gives them a lot of other benefits and fatah you know the organization that you know israelis are hoping that they uh that they vote for instead is incredibly corrupt um yeah. so it's like it's not as complex people are not only voting on this issue. Israelis are not only voting on Israeli-Palestinian politics. Palestinians are not only voting on is Israeli-Palestinian stuff. They're also voting on, like, they have other issues that they're voting on the table. And so, in some ways, there are some, like, rational reasons to vote for Hamas. Not that they should, but I don't I don't completely hate them for it. You know? Like, I understand. Yeah. And that, that's <laughs> a huge problem with Hamas in general, is that it took a lot of inspiration from, from uh, Hezbollah. Uh, where it wasn't solely a terrorist organization in that it, its its sole intent wasn't just bombing. It was heavily involved within the community and funded community-based schemes like education, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, which led to the communities at large being almost dependent on on their their leadership and their 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 money um, in return for support. Um, but just just on the topic of um, not knowing much about Palestinian issues, just an anecdote of when when I was walking through um, the West Bank with uh, my friend, who's first time they've been to been to Israel, they um, they had no idea that Palestinians could be Christians. They they, they thought the entire population of, of Palestine was 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 Muslims. It, it again, brings the the issue of no no Palestinian is is a monolith, uh, just just like Jews. But anyway. Well, right, Palestinians, uh, there used to be Jewish Palestinians, right? Yeah, so uh, um, they yeah. just they would become Israelis. This is the kind of shit I'm talking about in chat. Someone added you and asked if you support the bulldozing of Palestinian homes. Like, get the fuck out of here with that. No, shit, but I'm dude. I, I'm used it's to like, that shit, right? Like it's... that's like you always have to prove whether or not you know you're you know you're the good kind of Jew. Are you a good um, Jew or are you a bad Jew? And it's unfortunate because are you most or bad witch? and I could tell Sorry. you just most most Jews in America and in Canada and in Europe. Um, they are just like everyone else. It sounds so coordinated to say they barely know about um, uh, about Israeli politics. They barely know about foreign politics, um, and they're just going about their daily lives. Most of them are not politically minded whatsoever. Yet they are always bombarded with that shit um, all the time, and it's like it really sucks. It just goes towards that whole thing that when like where it feels like when you're in a minority, your entire existence just feels political, mm. um, and it's very very frustrating. So like. Yeah, so I, I don't, like, I understand, especially why people are pro-Palestinian activists, like, they get really frustrated with just automatically getting called anti-Semitic. Um, 
totally makes sense, right? Especially when like there's so many awful things going on right now with the Palestinians and you want to just get to the heart. You just want to help them instead of having to go through what it feels like this SJW like loophole. Um, but I, I think you'll get there faster if you come at it with like kind of a bit of compassion for why Jews are sensitive about this kind yeah. of stuff as well um and you'll you're more likely to actually end up because i think the best way to help palestinians number one um is to i mean number one is to de help de-radicalize uh, palestinians but number two is to convince israelis like you know you need to change the hearts and minds of israelis so it's like you're not going to change an israeli's mind if you're not using the if you're using language that immediately makes um makes jews very very defensive Go yeah. ahead. I mean, I uh, think hold on, hold on. Dan, Sorry. Dan, please. Uh, how I would, how would you? Um, I'm just asking this question to Eris. Do you, how would you deal with like people who don't exactly have like the best interests, like Ben Shapiro, who calls them like calls himself like Jewish. However, they accuse everyone else who is left leaning Jewish in name only, for example. I mean, that kind of attitude is just so typical of the of religious orthodox jews um that like right. i i don't know like the best way to handle it it's just it's like the same thing with any people that are very dogmatic and and very religious um that like i just i don't know i hope that they get as little power as, as possible um with that attitude because it's, it's very very frustrating no thank you is there a way to uh, I, I guess I'm asking too much. Um, uh, I was like thinking of, of sidelining them within the community, but like there's no, I mean, like for instance, like Ben Shapiro, his power does not come from the Jewish community. It comes from the, the larger online uh, right that he's uh, created. So there's not much that Jews can do to sideline. If you think, if you think his opinions are extreme, just like he's in a more, he's in a sect of like a section called like modern Orthodox Jews. Um, and that is nothing in comparison with um, the dogmatism in Orthodox Jews. Um, and I'm not just, obviously, I'm trying, I'm, I don't want to call out just Jews specifically. This is a problem in almost all of the Abrahamic religions, um, but where they become, especially the ones that become incredibly insular and they become very, very extreme um, with their attitudes. There is a common idea um, being spread in the, if you guys have ever read Leviticus um, or the Old Testament, there is a tribe called Amalek, which is, it's taught to you as being like this evil tribe. It's not a real, um, they're not really humans. They're just like, they're evil in human form. Um, and in the original Leviticus, uh, God literally orders Solomon to, I think it's Leviticus, um, orders a, a Solomon to kill all of Amalek and to literally genocide them. And Solomon, he kills them all and he leaves just like one mother and son. Um, and that's like how the story goes and then evil continued in, in the world. So they always theorize that like Hitler is a descendant of Amalek and all of this stuff. Um, and there is a common attitude that the Palestinians are literally Amalek as a people. And it's a very, very dangerous like idea, obviously, right? Because, um, and that's what leads to a lot of people becoming like Kahanis um, and uh, yeah, and everything like that. There's, um, but there's some amazing Israeli organizations that are still technically Zionist, right? Um, that's why I don't want people to just throw out, think that that's just like a automatically dirty word Can right now. The, Can you define that word for people? I think right now it just means that you believe in the ex like existence of of Israel, and that's and that's it, right? Mm. Um, at, at least and at least for for now, the existence of Israel as a Jewish state. Mm. Um, the, the but, concept of yeah. sorry, like the concept of Zionism is definitely like if if you're in uh, like a history department, for example, you will you'll be talking about this extensively because there's there's loads of varieties of Zionism that cross mm. different different temporal planes. But for like contemporary politics, talking about Israel and Palestine, it just isn't really that necessary because you don't need to, to institute the, the concept of Zionism to talk about Israel and to talk about Israeli politics. Uh, because, for example, the Labour Party may, for example, be classified as, as, as a form of Labour Zionism, but you don't need that to talk about the policies and, and topics that they're talking about. It's it's an interesting topic of his, historiographical, um, historiographic uh, discussion, but for, for modern discussion, you don't really need it. And like Eris said earlier, it's become a dog whistle. Where when someone mentions Zionism, you like my ears prick up and I'm like, oh, okay. What what are they about to say? Like what what else are they going to say? But sorry, I interrupted you, Iris. 
just to do a little plug, I did make a YouTube video, um, which was uh, asked, answering the question whether or not I was a Zionist, and I kind of get into um, the history and the differences of the, yeah, of the word and the association and stuff. Um, I it just in general, I do think it's like problematic. I know I understand why people are like against like ethno states and stuff. I don't know if I would even call um, Zionism an ethno state because obviously there are multiple ethnicities that make up Jews and people can convert into it and all that stuff. Um, and it's very different. Like keep in mind, like white genocide is like not a thing, right? It, it's Whereas an ethno religious Jewish, state, huh? Yeah. Where whereas like you know, Jewish genocide was a thing. Um, and so like, it totally makes sense to me, um, especially why like, a, why historically oppressed groups would want to at least temporarily have their own self-determination. Um, uh, so like, I, I, I understand it. Um, I don't know if I agree with it, like dogmatically. Well, that's what I said. Most Jews live in America. So like, the, pe pe people need like, uh, and, and like, terms of economically like education and stuff um jews in the united states except they do experience hate crimes and anti-semitism that is a thing that really fucking sucks but in terms of like uh thriving and like not being genocided or bombed or shot um i, I would say american jews are probably more successful than israeli jews by and large like you don't need you don't need to form an ethno state to protect yourself against destitution can i ask you aris um like what's your um so you've you've changed, you've shifted uh, in your attitudes towards Israel, right? Like you've, you've, you're, you've been uh, implying that you've had this evolution here. So where are you currently at in terms of like the this um, conflict, right? Um, like well, what solutions do you see uh, moving forward? Like realistically, one, I guess, two things, right? Um, one, uh, idealistically, and on the other one, like pragmatically, like what are the solutions that you'd like? Um. Well, I guess I was raised with like a lot of um, Jews in the, in the diaspora and stuff. I was raised with a lot of dogmatic like Zionism um, with a lot of myths and like narr like and false narratives that were kind of um, spread around. Mostly the idea that, um, you know, we just wanted a little sliver of land and everyone else gets tons of land and we just want a little bit and they wouldn't let us because they just hate us. Um, that was a very like common kind of like typical Zionist narrative, um, which is obviously it's a little more complex than that. Um, and so when I went to university and I learned about what, uh, like how much, how many of those narratives were kind of wrong, I think I jumped so much the extremely other way. Um, just as a lot of, you know, undergrads do when you first, you get like your little taste of a little bit of truth and you're just like, oh, like, you know, you just find out a little bit of lies about capitalism and then you're like full commie um, as responsive is kind of like that. And I think like over time I've learned I have realized that I had some anti-biases as a consequence of that. Um, and I've just tried to, I, I've kind of leaned over, you know, thinking, okay, Israel is a state. It exists right now. Um, and I need to think of, and I, and I want to participate in practical solutions on trying to get the Palestinians their state of what they were promised in 1948 as well. Um, and so I'm very focused on things that I think practically can happen. So I don't think practically um, uh, there can be like a full, uh, there could be a, like a full right of return where all the, um, they're originally 700,000 uh, Palestinian refugees. They're now in like the millions. There's no room for them. So I don't think requiring a land of a right of return is viable. Um, and whereas I would say like, you know, there should be reparations, um, there should be, uh, you know, there, uh, Israel needs to stop illegally occupying land. Um, but in order for Israel to stop illegally occupying land, they need to be less concerned about their security issues, right? Um, so there's like a bunch of things that are practically, so I guess I just, I, I would fall probably, I would say like um, center left in the current like Israeli kind of like discourse, though it depends. Like, I mean, uh, um, people who are very Zionist just think I'm like super anti-Israel. Like my dad thinks I'm like extremely anti-Israel. Like he'll always say that, like, oh, the university's ruined you, you know, um, like kind of attitude. So, um, but then, uh, yeah, I don't, but I don't know. I don't have like the attitude that super anti-Zionists have either. Um, I'm not a, a centrist, I, don't hate me. The, the black pill is that uh, nothing's going to be done. Um, Palestine will eventually no, be annexed. No, I don't. Fully. I don't uh, think that's it, true. I I really think it, that as, as long as as long as the Security Council and uh, the Human Rights Council 
are unable to investigate and levy any charges against anyone in government, nothing's going to be get done. The, no, the, you the, know I, the, I, I have a new hope. In every, every, ti- every time the UN has tried to vote on uh, like investigating war crimes or whatever abuses done by Israel to punish them in some way, American veto every time. Most of our vetoes have been used to specifically to stop action against Israel. Well, that's because the United yeah, States is even, the unconditional the UN, ally of Israel. Okay, keep well, in mind yeah, that's what I'm the, saying. We can't stop the United States. Yeah, but like, when the UN was was really against Israel, and it still is really against Israel, it didn't help um, the situation at all. I don't even think the answer is in the UN. Like, to to me, it's very viable. It, what gives me hope is when I talk to, on my show, like, I get to talk to a lot of um, young Palestinians, and they are, a lot of people don't realize that Palestinians, like, and especially Palestinians that live in the West Bank and Gaza, they are the most highly educated um, youth group per capita in the entire world. Um, they're incredibly, incredibly educated, and I have a lot of hope when I talk to that generation. Um, that because Israel is going to have very, very little excuses once, um, especially that population stops voting for Hamas, or maybe they potentially create a new party out of this new electoral system. Um, and, uh, you know, and their and their arguments are just not something that can be used by the right um, to advocate for bulldozing homes and all that stuff. The more you de-radicalize Palestinians, naturally Israelis become de-radicalized too. It's just like a cycle effect. So I am I am hopeful. Um, eventually, I would like to see kind of like you know like obviously like a one state in the you know in the region that's non-religious, non-ethno focused, um, where everyone lives in peace and harmony. But I think that you need to get there organically over time. The way to get there is to have two states um, with the with two with those two oppressed peoples like living under their own self determination um, and under peace for a significant amount of time. So can I um, ask you a question? That's what I would focus on. But the thing is, like the reason why I say that I don't I I I, I do think. Like I want to hope, right? I want to hope that peace will, you know, peace in the Middle East, right? Uh, I just like, it, like the black. I've, I've just taken this black pill for a long time. I don't think like the the well, the 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 size Palestine is right now, versus how fast it's being annexed, versus the treatment that is not slowing down, uh, versus like how the international community behaves towards the conflict, plus the the views of each side holds of each other, plus like what people believe about like because the, the plurality of both sides want a two state but the thing is like two states been dead in the water for 30 years like like every, every time a, a two state solution people come to the table they they literally can never yeah, agree on I borders really they can never agree on like what the delineation is no there it, there, there was a plan that agree. was created in 2001 where like a very good plan happened. um well yes there happened through, right? right yeah but just because it yeah. fell through you know okay is okay it's just france and england war for like 600 years um and now they're the best of allies right all it took were some nazis like i'm not shit, sure like, about that one they, <laughs> they just they still make some little jokes they, but they share intelligence and all that stuff you would have never guessed that two 300 years ago so like the i do think it's certainly possible like we see that in history like throughout where like old enemies can potentially become allies it's it's certainly possible um with like small moves towards like um towards peace and especially with what's going on um with the with palestinians and the new youth movements and stuff there is like just in general i think that um one of the biggest um stops towards peace was a what what originally happened is when the Israelis were more likely to start offering peace, the Palestinians were less likely, they were more dogmatic, they were ruled by someone like Yasser Arafat, now they're led by someone like um, Mahmoud Abbas, and they're much more likely to, and they're more willing to offer um, peaceful solutions, and Israel's gone kind of like the opposite way, and it's like unfortunate, but I do feel like it's, you know, it's not like super naive to think that it it might, you know, there might be actually a viable solution. Even though the youth has become more right-wing than previous generations, though? The youth in Israel, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I I don't almost, know. I don't almost seventy percent of youth identify as right wing in Israel. Yeah, but I think that that's just like the current political paradigm. Um and because of the um the amount of Palestinian uh the the rockets and all this stuff. And I think like when Palestinians become very de radicalized, the, the right wing in Israel is gonna have um very, very little to to start complaining about. The what I will say, um Oh shit! I just I actually totally forgot the point I was gonna make, you, but I'll I'll remember afterwards. Do you have a Do you have a deep stain 
well, just add some Nazis and get that right out of there. Because this is like... I was just going to say, uh, apparently yeah. all we need is... No, you just Nazis. need an alien invasion. The, the, the annexations... <laughs> The annexations continue, so I, right? Like, yeah. the, the government becomes more right-wing and sure. stays right-wing over time. No foreign country is going to do anything. Like, uh, like th this is a, a 15, like, t not even 10% of the land of Israel anymore is Palestine, like, the West Bank and Gaza. And then, like, th this is, like, a, si a land, like, Palestine, if you put it together. This is, a, this is a place that's the size of my, like, congressional district. Like, this is, no, like... No, no, it's tiny. But... It, it's... Like it's gonna be. But right, Charlotte, soon. I like, think one of the problems was Palestinian liberation historically was focused on things it could not get right, which was mostly Israel being wiped off the map, um, and some parts of it is are still focused on that. But they are moving away from that with Mahmoud Abbas, right? Like a lot, he gets a lot of hate for that, right? Yeah, but they've moved away from that, and the problem is organizations like BDS are still in that old mindset. Um, of trying to, you know, just completely geologitimize oh, no. Israel's existence, wipe Israel off of the map, um, and I think moving towards more practical solutions and focusing on at least ending the occupation, like at least first stopping settlements, ending the occupation, and at least acknowledging Israel's existence like Fatah did. When, when did they officially acknowledge it? It was like 15 years ago or something? I think that that's like those moves are the way to kind of move forward. Um, like so, like for, like thirty, forty so percent of Palestinians like believe in like a like a two state solution, but like mo most most Palestinians still believe in like river to sea, like they still want to eliminate Israel. Like, so let's go to uh, sorry, um, uh, Mayor want to say something. Also, I think uh, Rain also wanted to. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, sorry, I'll wait, you, no, I'll, you go, you go, you go. Um, I've been actually like dealing with this quite a bit myself uh, wondering like how how do we engage with our complaints with the Israeli government and and separate that from you know hatred towards the Jewish people uh, for a very long time because my fears has always been especially as an indigenous person that deals with you know these kinds of things here in the United States when we talk about land back and like getting indigenous land back and things like that people automatically assume we want to wipe out white people or kick them out or whatever we want to uh, an indigenous ethno state which none of that is true and I, I think one of the first questions I had for Eris is like how do one how do you suggest that we engage with the Israeli government separate of the Israeli people and the Jewish people and not give uh, or can we? Can we in, can we do it at all and not give uh, the actual anti-Semites, like you know, the actual died in the wool Nazis, um, any any more stuff to use, or are they just going to take it no matter what we say? Right? Like if we if we talk about you know, for example, how you know um, Benjamin Netanyahu, right? You know, said in 2019 that Israel is not a state of all of its citizens, but rather the nation state of the Jewish people and only them, right? And in 2005, you know, the Prime Minister Errol Sharon said, you know, there's no need to hide behind security arguments. There's a need for the existence of a Jewish state. These types of statements from leadership in the Israeli government are come off as though like the only goal of the Israeli government is the complete eradication and destruction of the Palestinian people. You know, like, so you how have, do you we can have, that? You can have Israel as a Jewish state and that not mean that it's erratic, like completely getting rid of Palestinian people. Like there's a viable solution that involves Palestinians having their own land um, and Is their there? own self-determination. Yeah. Um, and, and Israel still being a Jewish state, at least for now. Um, yeah, it's a two-state solution. It was negotiated during the Oslo Accords. It's very famous. Um, right. And it's a very viable solution, right? Um, it's still viable to this day. The problem is, is that like every single time Israelis build settlements, it becomes less and less viable. So the first thing I would focus on is trying to discourage settlements um, okay. and make your advocacy. When you're when you're doing your anti-Israel advocacy, don't call it, I, I, when you, I, I just did it, but don't call it anti-Israel. Don't call it anti-Zionist. Just say you're against settlements. Say you're against occupation. Like be specific on the issues. Get knowledgeable on it. And if, if you, and I think what you asked is a very good question. Um, the biggest thing is I, I mean, I'm a little biased here, but I think you should learn, people should learn about the history. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. It's just the same thing that like when you want to talk um, responsibly about indigenous issues, like in Canada, you need to learn about indigenous history. Um, yes. And the what and so and it's the same thing. If you want to just get into the Israeli Palestinian conflict, it is a lot but it is possible for you to for the average person to learn about it there are some good books and i'm happy to re recommend some um but 
the biggest thing is I would learn about the history of anti-Semitism because once you learn about that, um, and I talk about, about that on my show a lot, but um, if you once you learn about that and you also learn about the history of what um, the Palestinians went through, you have to understand the region itself has a history of trauma because it's just been the victim of colonialism and imperialism over and over and over again for thousands of years. So it's never been independent until 1948. So like if if you understand that history, um, you're going to be less likely to be engaging in anti-Semitic like Semitic, um, tropes and stuff when you are criticizing Israel. And that's just going to be more effective to help Palestinians. Like, but the, the thing is, like, um, you fall, a lot of people in conversations fall into this trap where it's like, mm-hmm. you say, oh, I'm criticizing the government. And then someone will respond in case, and be like, yeah, but the people support the government. So you just, like, hate the people. People do this with China all the time. And this happens also in the, in the Israel, like, Palestine thing, where you say, oh, it's the government, and then they go, but the people support the government. So you de facto, like, hate Jewish people or whatever. So it's like super, I, with certain people, it's super hard to, like, get out of that thing of being accused of being an anti Semite. I, mean, well, that, okay, I like, think that's a really because, stupid argument. Right? I mean, I think yeah, I think I've never like heard that before, but I Because really you know. hate the American government, you must hate every single American, right? Like, and especially yeah, as an exactly. indigenous person, right? I hate the American government. I'm I'm Native American, right? I'm no. Uh, it's specifically so it's, that because the they support the government and they support oh, the they things support the government are doing. Government, I have right? never yeah. in my life, like I'll be honest, I'm around a lot of like pro-Israel Zionist people, and I've never heard them say that. So like me, I'm, I'm not saying I'm sure you're being honest, right? But it really does feel like that's a um, a minor. Um, a minor issue. What what I see more commonly is Jews being maybe a little overly sensitive um, about anti-Zionist or anti-Israel rhetoric um, because it's so often we've almost like been trained to kind of see it. It's like almost like the way um, when you know when someone is criticizing the black community and they're saying like the black American community and they're saying oh like you know there's a problem with single motherhood. Okay, and immediately like almost every black person I know. When they hear that shit, they're just like, that's a dog whistle. Like immediately, even though like, you know, you could think of there could be like many rational reasons why someone would say that. Um, there, it's totally understandable to immediately feel like, oh, this is a dog whistle. And that's how Israelis feel. So I've never seen it kind of um, the argument being made that just because the majorities of Israelis um, vote for something. And then if you're against that vote, like that would make no sense because, um, you know, the majority of Jews in uh, like Jews in the United States don't even like support a lot of the dogmatic practices that happen in Israel all the time. No, it's, it's There's not that a it's lot a good of... argument. It is a bad argument. The point is people yeah. use it anyway to dismiss you as an anti-Semite yeah, but you or, can they'll, just... or they'll say or they'll say, uh, oh, you hate Israel. Israel's a Jewish state. You hate Jews. Like people do yeah, this. But you could so like, easily, frequently. you could just so easily crack that down. And I really don't think that a lot of people are going to use that argument because it's just it's so ineffective. The um, and it, just in Israel, right? Um, there's if I if I like moved to Israel, I wouldn't, and I fell in love with um someone that was not, was not Jewish, or even if I say I fell in love with someone that was Jewish, but I wanted to have a reform ceremony, um, like reform Jewish ceremony to get married, I would not be allowed to do that. Right. Like I would not have the right to do it. I have to go get married outside of the country. Like because in Israel and you have to follow all these dogmatic religious rules when you're a Jewish person, um, whenever you're doing like religious rights, like, you know, marriage, birth, like um, uh, circumcision, etc. So there's like there's tons and the majority of Jews don't support that shit. But there's like a lot of historical reasons of why the religious have like um, dominance over, you know, religious rights in uh, in Israel. So like there's tons of reasons and like just and, just and you can support you can be against that shit and, and not be necessarily a dissematic the problem do. is you don't want to participate in there are specific narratives that a lot of critics of israel do participate in and i don't think they're being intentional like um i don't think the majority of critics of israel like are thinking oh like i'm so excited to participate in this you know jew anti-semitic trope of you know blaming uh, israel for all the world's um ills and you know and all that stuff but like if you're say talking about you know the influence of apac um on the united states okay and the, the language you use is okay i'm very concerned about the zionist influence on american politics like that's actually a very legitimate point of view, right? Like, I know what you're saying, and there's probably a really good argument for that. Lots of but, people have but, gotten but heat, very, like, yeah, but very media attention and sure, called anti-Semites okay, for saying yeah, but, that specific thing. No, one took it. Yeah, but, yeah, sure, that's, but, it, but if someone says that to me, right, I'm immediately going to be like, 
oh my god anti-semitic like that's like that's the reaction because and and this is why you should always study the history of anti-semitism before you kind of engage in this stuff because there was there is a huge trope specifically using the word zionist um to denote like zionist influence like zionist control all this stuff so it's just not a good idea to be using so it makes you more aware of the language that you're using so it's like i don't think i i really don't think it's like inevitable you're just going to be called an anti-semite for criticizing israel you just need to like you just need to be more you just need to be more careful right and you need to be more knowledgeable about the history of you know of the uh, parties involved well i think i think i have i have one question like a very very specific question for you uh, Eris, if, if you wouldn't mind. But before that, actually, uh, I know we were talking about books before and we mentioned Zionism. So if you did want to actually read about the, the history of Zionism, there's a great book by Zachary Breiderman, I think I'm pronouncing that pro- uh, correctly, that's just labeled Zionism. You should totally read that. It's great. Anyway, um, Eris, I wanted, I wanted to get your opinions on the practicality of vertical sovereignty in, in Jerusalem. Sorry, you can have. you repeat the last part again? Yeah, uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts on the practicality of vertical sovereignty within Jerusalem. Oh, um, wait, are you talking about... Um, the, uh, the concept of uh, the temple being um, Israeli-owned and Al-Aqsa being um, a Palestinian state through through similar mechanisms that um, Saudi Arabia has over um, Mecca? Oh, yeah, I mean, obviously I think that's really stupid. Um, but I, uh, again, like this is why, you know, non, non secular, like, sorry, uh, secular Israelis need to have more babies and secular people and we need to have more babies in general. Cause, um, right now the, like the majority opinion, and I mean, it's illegal for me as a Jewish person to even like step on the temple mount. Like I'm not even allowed to go there. Um, Israel right now is very good about protecting the rights, um, of, uh, um, you know, of Muslims um, to kind of have control over the area. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of history. You know, it's not not nice that the original temple got destroyed. Like, but yeah, you don't want to just become your own monster by trying to fix monsters of the past. Um, something leftists need to need to be very more consistent on. Am I um, right? The, the <laughs> game the, the game plan is to we gotta we gotta outbreed right wingers. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, yes, but um, yeah, actually, I I'm gonna be creating my you know my baby making <laughs> system on CT <laughs> if you guys want to join. Um, but yeah. uh, um, my my more uh, I would prefer immigration over pro natalist policies, but I mean I I completely understand where you're coming from though. I would, yeah. I would prefer the, education. The, and, the, the, and the thing is with uh, the thing is I would say both because eventually. At least I think so. Um, a lot of leftists will disagree with me, uh, my peers. Uh, I think eventually all countries will be developed countries. Eventually. Might be a long time, but eventually. And as we've seen historically, as a country develops, their birth rates drop just because naturally people just, they don't have babies anymore. Um, so like you you will need pronatalist policies because eventually the whole world will have low birth rates because you can't just infinitely have like immigrants come into every country because immigrants don't come from the ether right they come well, from other countries right yeah. I, I highly disagree with that we, we we're, there's going to be some areas where they're due to social economic reasons and even cultural reasons that they will probably would never were able to get out of their own situation and that's way far in the future probably beyond you, you think there's going to be a point where a country can never escape like undeveloped mm-hmm. status well, a lot of. Their, I mean, that's yes, a pretty, that's a pretty a bleak of... outlook. Not gonna lie. <laughs> no, I mean, but, uh, if you okay. if, if you look at lots, the status lots. of multiple countries in the world right now, especially in the global right. south, especially countries say in in Africa, right, or you know even Indonesia or other countries, right, that are are not as fully developed as the global north is, and you see a lot of this being caused by the fact that the global north that europe and the united states and in you know the commonwealth nations have a global majority on trade a global majority on technological development and advancement um you know of course the fact that china and india and russia are starting to you know more openly compete on the global market than you know the u.s because you know four years where the trump destroyed the u.s's uh, uh trade capability overseas but uh, I think it is actually like possibility that we will see countries that, you know, at least for several more decades, if not 100 years or more, will 
will continue to be poverty stricken um, because of colonialism, because of imperialism, because of the fact that so many colonialist imperialist nation states have maintained such a hegemonic dominance over global trade and, and and the development and dissemination of technology i mean we we can even see it within countries that are developed these sort of microcosms of places like for example here in in my state of ohio you know we've got a town that you know started existing in the 18 late 1800s uh, still, you know, ha- doesn't even have modern access to the internet or modern telecommunications equipment and things like that. And that's prominent throughout the United States, especially in rural America. Well, but I'm we- not talking about the abolition of poverty. I don't think that will be a thing for a long, long time. I'm talking about the mm-hmm. abolition of like, like by and large, like most of the country would be like developed or have a okay. like meaningful develop. standard of yeah. Like, this is this is the really issue. You're not, you're not, having like above a cer- having above a certain threshold of like access to uh like what's, economic stability thriving threshold? technology this, i i can i'm not going to give you a, a line this is a continuum fallacy just because you don't have like no a, this is this is what I, this is exact what line said. doesn't mean that doesn't mean that eventually someone when they cross the line you'll know that they cross the line like this is this like is, an insane like position to take this is unless you believe you would have to in order for this to be any sound at all you would have to take a position you would have to take a position i'm talking to rain i'm not talking to you Okay, yeah. Okay, sure. You, you, Finish you your point, take, and then you, you can continue take to talk out to someone else. I'll just mute you. Like, shut the fuck up. Like, oh, okay. Rain. You would have to take the position. Talk the entire no such, conversation. That there's, that there's no such thing. I've literally been talking for, like, 20 seconds. Shut the fuck up. Like, okay. Rain. Like, they're, 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 like, you would have to take the position that there's no such thing as developed or undeveloped countries. That this concept just doesn't exist. Oh, you want and to if say, I did you take want that to position? Respond. It would be dumb as fuck. You want to respond? I would, okay. Mayor, mayor. <laughs> That's that's your that's your that's yeah. your response. Yeah. That is to just you want to say me. something. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, my 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 answer to that is yes. The concept of developed and underdeveloped nations is false. It's completely not seen within the literature anymore. It's actually seen as a pretty colonial narrative, viewing something as developed and underdeveloped. Yes. Which is why I'm pretty sure Rain already used it. We use the concepts of global north and global south she. now. Oh, sorry, okay. she. I apologize. She oh. she used that. Um, because we use um, world systems analysis or world systems theory, which is developed by, I've got the book there, Wal- Walstein, which argues that using developed and developed, underdeveloped, is employing a Westphalian framework, which is essentially saying we shouldn't look at nations or we shouldn't look at societies through the concept of nations because, as Rain said, mm-hmm. there are portions of nation states that are quote unquote very underdeveloped and we shouldn't look at them like that because it's well, not I mean, arbitrary it, 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 threshold. Back you up real quick, Mayor. I mean, especially as an indigenous person, right, who's who's been on reservation land, but I wasn't born on reservation land, right? All parts of reservation land within the United States would be considered quote unquote underdeveloped, right? Yeah, Which, they are. You know, that's it's over six million people in a country of three hundred and twenty million. So then can we state that the United States in and of itself is fully quote unquote developed? No, it isn't. So yes, <laughs> position and i take that position, position because the lit no because the literature and the modern science and the modern view of things actually that's does support that's not that even view. true what you're talking yeah. your your position is the niche one it is true hey, it is true if you're citing literally right book, there the world you, systems you, analysis you, i've read the book this is literally like, the niche niche position like most okay. people believe okay. in the concept of it's a developed country wrong. and underdeveloped country. Okay, yeah. I do. I do developed have to go. And, so I just want to put a last by, word by like multitudes of standards. What are you talking about? Like income, oh, access yeah. to healthcare, quality so of life, access to sanitation. Everyone, great, thanks. Anyway, um, we're ending stream now, one way or the other. So, uh, Eris, you can say your last point. Okay. Well, I, I will just say, right, is that. Um, I think the Israeli Palestinian, the Israeli Palestinian conflict, whether you're involved in it or not, is kind of like a good example, or I guess a problematic example, um, of the long-term effects of um, imperialism and colonialism, and why imperialism is a really, really awful thing. Um, the region of Palestine um, has been a victim of um, of occupation and of imperialism from you know dating back to the you know the Roman Empire to the Byzantine Empire to the Ottoman Empire to the British Empire um, it is a traumatized region um, and with and the people who live there are as a whole are traumatized and so I think that when you engage with it as you whenever and this is it's Israel's not unique in this like there's a lot of other nations um, in the middle in the Middle East there's a lot of nations in Africa that are the same 
Um, and obviously in the Americas. So it just in general, I think having, it sounds corny, but I think having a little empathy um, for the groups involved in the effects of um, that imperialism. And it's one of the reasons why I hope that, you know, the inheritors of, you know, of that imperialistic kind of history, like the United States or, you know, Europe, um, do you have some kind of uh, moral responsibility to try to try to help? So, but yeah, that's, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, that's I was all fascinated and by all to, this. And to, uh, yeah. to my audience, to my audience, hi. Uh, to my audience, we will be back on Monday. Um, if you have stumbled onto this channel, if you're enjoying this content, do yourself a favor, hit that follow button right now. Make sure notifications are on. Uh, we do give these content six days a week. Um, a lot of content. We'd love to, to have you back here in the future.